We're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And if you're able to stand, please stand with us for the reading of the Word of God. Then we'll have prayer together. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is the record of God's creation. And uh, this happens to be, as we're reading here in Genesis 1, the sixth day of creation. By the way, the six days means six literal 24-hour days. And uh, verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And of course, the plural pronouns there, us and our, refer to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them talking about mankind, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Let's pray. Father, we pray again tonight that you'd meet with us as we study your word. We recognize tonight that the book that we have before us is the word of God, that it's your message to us. Lord, it's the the textbook for which uh, you have provided for us the, the doctrine, the principles that we need, Lord, to go through life, to live, to please you. And we thank you for the Spirit of God that indwells every believer that is given to us to guide us into all truth and instruct us. We pray tonight that that would be the case. Help us to be refreshed, reminded. And Lord, maybe uh, especially for the younger ones among us to be, Lord, just a clear, more clear about the simple Word of God referring to Uh, mankind. We pray for these things. We pray that you'd work in our hearts as only you can through the word of God. And we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, The proper uh, term for the subject, the doctrine of man is anthropology. Anthropos uh, speaks of man, mankind, and and in the, the word logos speaks of doctrine or teaching or words, the study of man. But the study of man, not from a humanistic perspective, but the study of man from a biblical uh, perspective. And the further down this road that we go away from our uh, beginning, as far as our nation is concerned, and as far as people's understanding of truth in the Bible, uh, the more more error there is in the way men and women think about everything, about God, but even about man. Evolution, in the eyes of many, has replaced the biblical doctrine of how man arrived on this planet and uh, that man evolved from other forms of life. Just had a conversation recently with someone, and, and they weren't being unkind. They were just repeating what they've heard, you know, believing that it took millions of years for us to evolve to the place that we are. But that's, that's becoming the norm. That's not a strange or unusual doctrine. That's really... Uh, the norm today. And then humanism, which is a religion that deifies man, that makes man uh, really the ruler of his own destiny. We get a lot of that, you know, just uh, believe in yourself and those kinds of things. And uh, and then uh, I'm just talking about areas that this this doctrine um, is needed. You know, we hear a lot, especially recently, from the extreme environmentalists and they really make man subservient even to animals, to plants, tree huggers, things of that nature because they elevate really uh, plants and animals above that of man. We just read in the scripture here where God made man to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the cattle and different things. So, that, so the world is messed up in this doctrine. But what does the Bible teach? And we'll, we're going we're gonna, to... Uh, center our thoughts around several main points. And the first one is man's origin. We read about it here in Genesis chapter 1. This is what the Bible teaches, that man was created 
by God, fully grown, fully formed on the sixth day of the creation, uh, the week of creation. And uh, that's what the Bible teaches. We don't have to change that. We don't have to, you know, it's not hard to believe. You know, people, people change their doctrine because they want to make it fit into, you know, science. We don't have to change our doctrine to fit into science. We just, we believe what the Bible says. And really a part, I believe, a big part of, of evolution is man's attempt really to discredit God's truth, to, to go around God's truth. And that's, I'll tell you, evolution in any form is a very evil and destructive doctrine. Amen. And it's so dominant in our culture. And there's one, more than one form of evolution. There's what we would call atheistic evolution. Evo atheistic evolution, as an atheist would say, rejects the reality of God and believes that man evolved over millions and millions of years from lower other life forms and uh, eventually became this great, this great masterpiece after millions of years of evolution. Uh, theistic evolution is different in the fact that theistic evolution teaches that God at the very beginning created matter and then through some process, evolutionary process, took over and uh, for instance the Big Bang Theory is a form of theistic evolution. They believe that God put matter in the universe but this great explosion took place. And it's, that's a lot easier to believe, right? That an explosion took place and eventually after millions of years there came out a man. Why would people come up with a doctrine of theistic, believing in God, theos, theistic evolution? And the answer is, as I said earlier, they want to reconcile modern science with the Bible. But we have no desire, we have no interest in trying to make the Bible meet up with modern science. By the way, where the Bible speaks about things that are scientific, it speaks accurately, and there's much in the Bible about that. So evolution is a very dangerous doctrine. Because of this evolutionary teaching, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing it all, I think, lived out before us, this generations of people who doubt the existence of God, who deny the existence of God, who want someone to prove to them there is a God, you know, the reality of God is evident everywhere. I, um, I was reaching for my phone. I, I recorded this morning. I was sitting out on my front porch before daylight, just as the sun is, sun hadn't even started coming up, but you're starting to be able to see forms and, you know, shadows. And I recorded the birds singing. And it was such a beautiful symphony. And you know who put all that together? It took millions of years for it to evolve. All those different tunes, all those different harmonies. No, God did that. It's not, the, God is evident around us. But because of this evolutionary teaching, people are doubting the existence of God and doubting the word of God and questioning God's truth. And even Bible readers, they read. As a matter of fact, you could read I'm pretty sure, unless it's changed, um, at, the, at, the, at the notes of one of the most common study Bibles uh, in, the, in the English language, you find notes about the Big Bang Theory as a possibility of how... No, that's not taught in the Bible. God, God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Period. So this is, that was an important message. This is man's origin. Now let's think about man's being, about man, how God made man. Let's go to our New Testament uh, and be turning to 1 Thessalonians, and we'll use that as a point of uh, beginning here on the second point, man's being. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And God made man as a three-part being. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, if you'd look there, it says, 
And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, completely. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, Paul writes. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. So God created man. When he made man, he made man with three parts. A spirit, a soul, and a body. Now there are people, and I won't uh, argue the fact with them, but there are people that believe the spirit and the soul are the same thing. But according to the Bible, I believe it teaches me that man is a three-part being. A spirit, soul, and body. And we know what the body of the man is. It's this fleshly part, this material form or part of man. The body is the, you could look at it like this, the body, young person, is the house where the real you lives. It's this, this body. But then the soul of man uh, is in itself a three-part uh, entity. The soul is the seat, the, the center of three parts of man. So man is a spirit, soul, and body. And the soul is where our intellect is, our mind, our ability to think. Uh, it's where our emotions are. That's a part of our soul. You know, when David said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, I think he's talking to his soul to bless the Lord. It's where your, your uh, mind, your emotions, and your will exist. Your mind, your intellect, your emotions, your anger, your feelings, your things of that nature, but also your ability to make choices. That's the man's soul. God created man with intelligence. That's good to know, isn't it? Especially if you have a teenager. There is hope. No, I'm just kidding. God created man with intelligence. God created man with emotions. Love, fear, anger, sorrow, grief, gladness. Man has emotions. And God created man with a volition, the ability to make choices. Man is a free moral agent, we hear sometimes. We have the ability to choose, to make choices. Uh, let's go, for instance, go to Joshua chapter 24. We're going to look up a few verses together tonight. Joshua chapter 24, one of those famous verses of the book of Joshua. Joshua. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, we're kind of jumping into Joshua's um, discussion here. But he says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you. There's the man's ability to choose. We're not robots. We have the ability to make choices. Choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And then Joshua says that, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a part of your soul. In your soul, you can think cognitively. You, can, you have intelligence. In your soul, you have emotions. In your soul, you have the ability to make choices. Uh, and from Joshua there, go to the left. Um, a little ways to Deuteronomy chapter 30. One of the great, great chapters of Deuteronomy chapter 30. But let's look at one verse together. Verse 19. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Aren't you glad God made us with a will, the ability to choose, the ability to make decisions? That's why you're here tonight, because you decided to come, or somebody decided for you that you would come. But we have the ability to make choices. I'm glad for that. Had a conversation recently, well, really a very engaging conversation with someone about uh, the role of parents 
and responsibility of parents and then how much responsibility a parent has for what their children do. Ezekiel wrote about that very clearly. Uh, I'm not going to turn to it tonight, but the Bible makes it clear that parents are, parents are not responsible for everything their children ever do and, and children are not responsible for the errors of their fathers. We have the ability to choose for ourselves. We, don't, we, can't, we can't say, well, I'm this way because of what everybody else does. No, we're, we're the way we are because of the choices that we make. So God made us a three-part being. And the matter of our will is an important part of the way God made us. Now, follow along with me if you would tonight. We have a will, but we're to surrender our will to God. We don't, God does not give us the, the freedom to just choose anything we want without any repercussions, without any kind of uh, consequences. We're to yield our will to God. Go with me, if you would, please, to the book of Ephesians. We're going to look in Ephesians chapter 6 and also a couple other passages there in the uh, New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6. Here's a passage that talks about the responsibility of children as far as their parents are concerned and Fathers, it's their responsibility as far as their children are concerned. And then he says in verse uh, 5, he's talking about servants obeying those that are uh, their leaders. But just one look quickly at verse 6. Talking about the way we respond to those that are, are having authority over us. Not with eye service, thy service. Not with eye service as men pleasers. In other words, not just doing something because they're watching you and you want to make sure they're they're pleased, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. That's a, that's a choice that we make. Verse 7, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. I, I am, I'm thankful for the ability God gave us to choose. Now, uh, we may in another time, in another lesson, dig down, dive down deeper on this subject but some people get conflicted about the sovereignty of God and His will and man's will. And, and there are those who believe in the providence and sovereignty of God that would actually nullify or, or disqualify anything that man does. But that's not taught in the Bible. And one of the things that we do as Christians is we learn you know, to really balance out truth and understand what the truth is. And the truth is, God, if he wanted to, God could do any, he could keep man from sinning if God wanted to, but God has chosen. This is not incidental. This is very important uh, th thought tonight. God has chosen to give us the choice, the right to make the right kind of decisions. And that does not say anything, that does not weaken God, that does not diminish God's authority. God is sovereign and His sovereignty, He gave us the ability to make choices. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Go to the Gospel of Matthew. We're talking about the way God made man with a body, a soul, and a spirit. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 23. And again, we'll just look at a passage to illustrate this point. Matthew chapter 23. Here we find Jesus near the end of the chapter speaking to and about his beloved nation, Israel, and the city particularly of Jerusalem. Matthew 23 and verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets... Think about these words. This is their record. This is their reputation. They did kill the prophets. O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often, Jesus says, would I have gathered thy children together. I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And ye would not. Here we find God's will. God's will is that he would have gathered his children together. But we find that they would not. 
We have the will of men. We have the will of God. We see this in 2 Peter chapter 3 where Peter wrote, And God is not willing. God is not willing. God does not desire. God does not want this. This is not God's preference. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So it's God's will that everybody be saved. Is everybody going to be saved? No. Why are they going to be saved? So some people would say, well, the reason that they're not saved is because God does not want them to be saved. The Bible never teaches that. The reason they're not saved is because they will not choose to submit to God's authority and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so we have the body. We're talking back to, the, back to where we were. God created man as the three-part being. He has a body. He has a soul. And thirdly, he has a spirit. And the spirit of man is closely related to the soul of man, but it's distinguished from the soul. If you would go with me to Hebrews chapter 4, many of you could quote this verse, uh, but we're going to read it in our Bible together. Hebrews chapter 4, because here, as it does in other places, makes a clear distinction between the soul and the spirit. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God, piercing. This is talking about God's word as a spiritual instrument. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What a powerful book this is that can penetrate our heart and can even dis dissect or distinguish or discern between the soul of man and the spirit of man. That's a pretty precise instrument. But the Bible clearly teaches that your spirit and your soul are different. What, so what makes the spirit of man different than the soul of man? The soul of man is his mind, emotion, and will. But the spirit of man is that part of man that has a God consciousness, that, God, that can communicate with God. And God, Jesus said, they that worship me must be worship me in spirit and in truth. Not in emotion, but in spirit and in truth. We have this consciousness. God, deal, God deals with us, and this is such an important thing, I think, based on what has become relatively fairly new I will say but but a, a, a big part of the way people want to worship God and it's based on their emotion we don't worship God in our emotion we worship God in our spirit the worship listen young person the worship of God is not about an emotional feeling it's about a spiritual communication and connection with God people look for music for instance that appeals to their soul, that appeals to their emotions. I want, to, I want to feel, I want to feel. Nothing wrong with feeling, but find me a place in the Bible where, it, where your feeling is the main part of worship. It's not. It's you communicating with God in your spirit. So there's a difference in the soul and the spirit. It's through man's spirit that we have fellowship with God. Go with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, and verse 27. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man, the spirit of man, that's not the Holy Spirit, it's man's spirit. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Now, we think of candles as something you just light and set on the counter and it makes a good smell. But in, in the old days, candles were for giving light, right? They lit a candle to illuminate, to enlighten. So the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The Lord, you, the Lord shows his light through our spirit. Look at the last part of that verse. 
searching all the inward parts of the belly. It kind of reminds me of that Hebrews 4.12 passage. God deals with us in our spirit. He convicts us of sin in our spirit. He, 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 he shows us things. And it's through his, his spirit, our spirit, that God's spirit works in our life. That's why a young person, please hear this. And I don't know why I'm just saying young people. It's relevant to all of us. But when a man is not in fellowship with God, there is a spiritual vacuum in his life. There's something inside of him that is lacking. And people try to fill that vacuum with lots of things. With entertainment, with media, all kinds of things. Friendships. You know why? Because they're missing the primary reason for their existence. And that is to have fellowship with God. To have a relationship with God. And people are trying to fill it with carnal things and worldly things. But those things cannot satisfy It may be pleasurable for a season. So God made man with a body. God created man. And he created man with a body, with a soul, and with a spirit. And before I move to the next point, I want to just make a couple of observations about how the spirit, soul, and man relate. Spirit, soul, and body of man relate. First of all, when God God made man, and I'll get into this in a moment. When God made man, he made man without sin. But he made man to be in fellowship with God, and he made man to uh, depend upon God. And so every part of our being, our spirit, soul, and our body are to be yielded to God, to the control of the spirit of God. God wants to influence our thoughts, for instance. We could spend a lot of time talking about that, but just but I think we, most of us would recognize that. We have a, there's a way that man thinketh that's uh, not right. It's, you know, it's not, it's not correct. It's not biblical. And God wants, us, God wants to influence our thoughts. He wants to influence, I believe, our emotions. God wants to influence our, uh, even the way we're to yield our body. He says, yield your members unto him as instruments of, of righteousness. We're to yield our minds to him. We're to yield our bodies to him. God wants all of our being to be yielded to him. And our spirit and our soul and our body are to be yielded to him, but also our spirit, soul, and body are to be influenced and directed by the word of God. How do I know what to think? I know what to think because God's word helps us know what to think. Uh, We're to bring every thought captive under the obedience of Christ. That's what God commands us to do. The Bible says, think on these things. You say, well, I can't change the way I think. Sure you can because you have a will. God made our soul with a will. We can choose. Sometimes we worry about things and we're reminded that God's in control. God wants us to yield our thoughts to him. So so God wants our spirit, soul, and body to be yielded to him and to be influenced and directed by the word of God. That's why we need to study God's word. Um, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We're to fill our minds with the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we're to be directed by the spirit of God in our mind, emotions, and our will, and through our spirit, soul, and body, and also by the spirit of God. But a third observation about the relationship of the spirit, the soul, and the body, and that is this. The the principles and the examples and the teaching of the Bible puts the spirit, soul, and body in a priority. It was in this priority in the passage we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The spirit was first, then the soul, then the body. And, And that's the way God intended for man to live. First and foremost, that we're a spiritual being. We have spiritual life. And our soul should follow after that. Our mind, emotion, and our will. And our body should follow after that. But lives, unsaved people, have that order all confused. 
Our bodies direct the way we live. Or our soul, our mind, our emotions, our feelings direct the way we live. And our, our, this mind, will, and emotions in our body, all four of those things, excluding the spirit, can hinder much in our spiritual understanding and obedience. And so listen, young person, a person, could, if just because you're saved doesn't mean that's all there is to life. You know what God wants? First Thessalonians chapter 4, he read it a moment ago. Your whole spirit, soul, and body be blameless before every part of our life. Yielded to God, to his control. You know, your body doesn't have, to, you, you shouldn't listen to your body about when to, well, maybe you need the rest, but I, about when to get up in the morning. Maybe you ought to set an alarm clock and get up while it's still morning. You know what I'm saying? I, we have to take, make choices about the way we live. We can't just do whatever feels good. So man was created as a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Man was created. The third thing I want to mention about briefly is man is an everlasting being. God made us to last forever. Not these bodies. They won't last forever. But the one we get, the new body we get, will be much better than the body we have now. Look at Matthew for a moment, chapter 25. Matthew, and we could look and find any number of references to this, but we'll just use this one. Matthew 25, the very last verse. Man was created by God. Man was created as a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. The soul is a three-part being itself, entity, mind, emotion, and will. That's how God made us. But man is an everlasting being. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. At the conclusion of this teaching that Jesus has given about stewardship and these kinds of things he said this and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal now regardless of what people may think God's word is clear God made man with a never dying soul that you and I are going to live forever somewhere, either in heaven with God or in hell. That's what the Bible teaches. We have this never dying soul. Uh, you say, well, what about the Bible says when, um, about death and dying? Well, death in the Bible doesn't mean the end of our existence. It just means the end of our existence in a particular form. It's really a separation. When a man dies, when a man dies, his body dies. It ceases to live, but his spirit and soul is already moved on to another place, hopefully to heaven. And so God made us that way. And I want to say to you, young person, you know, you may think you've got a long time to live. And as a young person, people think like that, man, I'll I'll live here forever forever. But you're going to turn around a few times and one of these days you're going to look like us. And you're going to realize you're on the other side. You're already on, um, the I won't say the downhill side, but you're on the other side. It happens. And you know what? No matter how long you live, one of these friends of ours that died the other day, we talked about he's 95 years old. That seems like a long life, 95 years old. But 95 years old is nothing compared to eternity. Eternity's forever. And somewhere you're going to live forever. And there's only two choices. There's not an in-between place where you can go and hope that somebody can pray you out of there. No, when you die, you go. In Luke chapter 16, we're, we all are familiar with that passage of Scripture where the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. And Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The moment they die, they go somewhere forever. So God made us as an everlasting being. Now the last thing I want to talk about is man was created in the image of God. We read these verses a moment ago in Genesis 1. God said, let us make man in our image 
And after our likeness, in verse 27 of Genesis 1, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? That does not mean that man has a physical appearance like God. Man is a three-part being like God is a three-part being. Man is body, soul, and spirit. God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Man is a three-part being. Second, man is a spiritual being like God. Not a, you know, I hope, I, I hope you know this, but you can't take for granted what people know. But one of the distinctions between man and animals is you're a spiritual being. Now, I'm not saying your dog is not a good dog. I am saying your cat is worthless, but I'm... <laughs> but as good as Fido is, he's not a spiritual being. God is a spiritual being, and we are spiritual beings. So we're made in the image of God. Thirdly, man is an everlasting being. God is an everlasting being. Being. We're made in the image of God. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and we'll end up there. And let's just talk for a little bit about man's relationship with God. One of the things that makes mankind unique is the relationship we have with God. In Genesis we find man walking in fellowship with God. Walking with God, the Bible says, in the cool of the day. Now, everyone, everyone, not everyone maybe, but most of us, at some point in our life, we start thinking about what is my purpose? Why am I here? You ought to think about that. Why did God put me here? I mean... If we believe the Bible, we believe we do have purpose, but what is our purpose? And two parts of that purpose is true of every person in this room. One part is that we have fellowship with God, that we have a relationship with God. It's a sad thing, you think about it from God's point of view, from God's perspective, how many men and women, no doubt, go through entire days, maybe entire weeks, and never really spend any time talking to God, learning about God, reading God's Word. They're missing their purpose in life. Young person, you're missing your purpose in life. Amen. If you don't have fellowship with God, if you're not, if God is not a, you know what God, it says about the wicked? Over in the book of Proverbs or Psalms, God is not in all their thoughts. That's, the, that's, that's not the way God made us to live. So number one, we were created to have fellowship with God. And second of all, and we could look at this in verses, uh, Revelation chapter 4, for instance. We are created to glorify God, to honor Him. He made all things for His own glory, for His own pleasure. You, God made you for his own pleasure. That doesn't mean he made you so he could laugh at you. Though I think he probably does find humor sometimes looking at us and the way we behave. But God made us for his own pleasure. That's our purpose in life. And before man sinned. Now this, this requires a bit of imagination. But before man sinned, he walked in uninterrupted Direct fellowship with God. That's the way God made man. And then as man was fulfilling God's will and he put man in the garden to care for the garden and God said, I'm going to give you some parameters. I'm going to give you some consequences if you mess up. But I'll, look at all this stuff. Unlike, unlike the fruit trees that I have in my yard, those fruit trees were bearing fruit. Mine are not. 
I checked on them. I let go for two weeks, come back, check on them. The same two apples that were on there when I left town are still on there. It's a miracle. The deer hadn't got them. But there's nothing else growing. But man, God said to man, everything you see, all the fruit of the garden, all these different trees are there for your benefit, for your, for your consumption. But there's one tree that I don't want you to eat. Because the moment that you do, the day, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And man sinned. We're talking about man's relate. God made man, how God made man, why God made man, and man's relationship with God. Look in Genesis chapter 3. We have this record. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? By the way, I see that same kind of logic in people's minds today. Let's listen to people questioning God. Did God really say this? Did God mean this when he said that? You know, about all kinds of matters, about all kinds of issues. Contradicting and twisting the word of God. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. She added a little bit to what God said. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. What a vile and wicked thing to say. Basically what he's saying is, You're not, don't believe what God said to you. That's not really going to happen. Young people, you ought to be thinking about this tonight. Because uh, God's, God's word is true. Verse 5 the serpent continues by saying, For God doth know that in that day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. God knows that if you do, you'll be enlightened. You'll become better. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. See, she believed what the serpent said. If I eat this, it'll make me better. It'll make me smarter. It'll, it'll be pleasant to my appetite. It'll be good for food. It's, it's, it'll make me better. And she took the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also to her husband with her. And he did eat. Now we're talking tonight, and I'm about to wrap this up, about anthropology the study the doctrine of man where man came from how God made man why God made man what it means for man to be in the image of God and then man's highest highest privilege and that is to to be in fellowship with God and bring God glory in our life but here we find in these few verses the record of the fall of man. We're going to talk about this more in our next lesson. The doctrine of sin. So the, serp the Satan through the serpent came into the garden of Eden to tempt man. You know what he wanted to do? Listen. He wanted to, he wanted to interrupt or break the fellowship that man had with God. By the way, by this we know at this point that Lucifer had already sinned and been expelled from heaven. And now he's bringing temptation to try to hinder fellowship. And you know what? We don't think like this sometimes. But this is really one of the, one of the greatest repercussions um, of sin, and we overlook it. Amen. And that is that Satan wants to tempt us to separate us from fellowship with God. Even if we're saved. We, we can't, that relationship with God can't be changed. But that fellowship with God can be changed. And the devil's so crafty, isn't he? We'll talk about this more 
in our next lesson. But he's so, he's so sly and so crafty that he makes us want something and makes us think what we want would be pleasurable. And then when we fall for it, then he says there's no hope for you because you can't ever be any different. He's slick at what he does. He's trying to separate us from fellowship with God. You know why? Because he hates God. He hates God. He's not a gentleman. He hates God, and he hates God's people. He hates us, and that's what he wants to do. The temptation for Adam, important thing to think about, did not come from within Adam. Adam did not, was not created with a sinful nature. The temptation had to come from without, and it came through the serpent from Satan, and um, Satan hadn't changed. If you just read over this, Satan hadn't changed. He's still subtle. He's still deceptive. He still tempts us by questioning God's word. Did God really mean this? Is this really what God meant when he said this? Did, could God have meant something else when he said that? That's the way he works. And then he casts doubt on the consequences. He said to Eve, that won't really happen to you, and that's the way he does us. He cast doubt. You can do this, and nobody will know, like Achan. When Achan took of that forbidden spoil from the battle um, at Jericho and he hid it in his tent and nobody will know about it. Yeah, well, somebody knew about it. God knew about it. You can't, the devil always wants to make us think that we can sin and there'll be no consequences. We can get away with it and it's not true. And here again, in verses 4 and 5, I'm not going to read it again. The tempter questioned God's goodness. You know why God doesn't give you that? Because he knows if you got that, you'd be a much better person. He's always questioning God's goodness. I'm telling you, God is good. Amen. But Satan wants us to question God's good. It's all the work of the enemy. His fingerprint is on all this kind of logic that's not founded in the word of God. So when it's happened, sin entered the human race. Okay, what did that sin do for Adam? In a sense, it did for Adam what it does for all of us. It brought guilt. It brought shame. It brought self-righteousness. He was going to try to cover himself up because of his shame and guilt, and that didn't work. He wanted to kind of present a good image. And then it says, the Bible says that God came to the garden calling out to him and Adam was hiding. You know why? Because that's what sin does. Sin separates us from fellowship with God and eventually brought death. And the lasting result was that all men are now sinful. We inherited that sinful nature from Adam and we're all guilty. Adam was not created with a sinful nature. Adam was not created with a corrupted nature, but the nature of man now is corrupted. Every person, every child has a corrupted nature. Our understanding, the Bible says, is darkened. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful. You've got a deceitful person living inside of you. You know who it is? It's you. All that came because of sin. Our mind and conscience has been defiled. And there's only one hope for us. And that's salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's regeneration that makes us a new creature that gives us a supernatural power living within us. The transformation that can come through Jesus Christ. You can't overcome it in your own. You can't, you can't work your way out of it. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. There's only one hope for all of us and that's Jesus Christ. And the good news is that hope is available to all of us. You may be here tonight and you're not saved. One thing this lesson should do for a person is let them see how much we need salvation. Because ever since Adam and Eve sinned, ever since what that tragedy in the garden, sin is passed upon the entire human race. And all of us are guilty before God. All of us. And you know, it takes the Spirit of God to convict a person 
of their need for salvation, doesn't it? It does. I sometimes look at people when I'm talking about sin, and it's like it doesn't even register with them. Young people who don't even, it doesn't matter. They don't think about it. You know why? Because the light has never been shined into their hearts that they could see themselves as a guilty sinner before God. But I tell you, when you see yourself as a guilty sinner, all of a sudden you're going to be looking for a way of escape. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank God for his goodness and his mercy today. When you listen to the philosophy of our day, You hear much about the goodness of man, don't you? Man is inherently good. Baloney. (laughs) Man is a sinner by nature, right? I know that that's not politically correct, but it's true. It's theologically correct. There's no good thing that dwelleth within me. There is no good thing that dwelleth within me that is within my flesh. Amen? God is good, though. Amen?